Welcome back to our exegesis, our interpretation of this strategic passage in James, chapter 2, 14 to 26. Now, so far, we've spent a fair amount of time and energy approaching the text from the grammatical, literary, and historical perspective. And that leaves then the theological perspective. And here, actually, instead of helping us, it actually kind of potentially creates a problem. Because when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we come to a possible conclusion that James might contradict Paul. And so that's the question we need to finally bring to a close. Are they contradictory or not? Well, I hope the answer is already clear to you. It should be from the different exegetical conclusions we've been making along the way. And the answer is clearly no. And the apparent contradiction stems from the fact that both of them use the same language, the same vocabulary of faith, but they use it to address quite different situations. So, for example, take James. What is his specific historical context, his Sitzum Laban? Well, we've seen that he's addressing a very serious problem in the Jewish Christian churches of Jerusalem and the surrounding area, namely the discrimination and neglect of the poor, either in worship or perhaps in matters of judgment. And so addressing that serious problem, what does he say about works? Well, he has a very positive view of works, not as a way to obtain righteousness. No, 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 no. But instead as a natural, as an essential, as an automatic element of true saving faith. And as we've observed already, James in our passage is actually not contrasting faith and works. That's a wrong way of thinking about this passage. James instead is contrasting faith and faith. One kind of faith with another kind of faith, namely a false, non-saving faith, contrasting with a true, saving faith. Now that's James. What about Paul? We haven't said anything about him yet, but his situation is quite different. Now, truth be told, we often overstate this situation. It isn't as in every letter this is Paul's context. Actually, it's primarily in Galatians and also in Romans, much less so in all of his other letters. But in Galatians in particular, and to a lesser degree in Romans, Paul is facing also a serious problem. Not a problem of discrimination, of neglect of the poor, but a problem that we might call legalism or works righteousness. These are people who think that they can uh, achieve a special status before God by their works of the law, by their obedience to the law. And so in that specific historical context, Paul has understandably not a positive view of works, but a negative one. And therefore, he stresses that a person is never justified by their works, by their deeds. They're instead justified by their faith, namely their belief in the person and work of Jesus Christ. But if you take Paul out of that specific context, if you take Paul out of Galatians and Romans, actually, even within Galatians and Romans, you can find it too. But if you, in other words, if you put Paul in a more neutral context, where he's not thinking about or worried about the danger of legalism or works righteousness, well, then Paul will be exactly like James. And Paul, too, will speak very positively about works or deeds that Christians automatically do. Again, not as a way to secure God's favor, but rather as a natural automatic response to God's favor. So, for example, Romans... Again, where he has in the letter some negative statements about the law or works. Notice here how positively he speaks about it. He says, and I maybe should backtrack a little bit to the earlier verses. He talks about God redeeming us in Christ. But he says in verse 4, all of this happened, why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law may, might be fully filled in us. And why? Because we no longer walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Paul expects Christians to walk fully according to the law. Paul expects Christians to obey the law, to do good deeds. Galatians, that's an interesting passage because here Paul at times speaks quite negatively about the law and about works. But here notice what he says in verse uh, 6 of chapter 5. He says circumcision really doesn't matter, uncircumcision doesn't really matter. What really matters is faith 
working itself out through love. That's striking because you see faith and the verb for work or works right together. Faith working itself out through love. And in a more neutral letter like Thessalonians, Paul's not worried there about legalism or works righteousness. He takes those two words, work and faith, which in another letter are opposed to each other and he puts them together in the same breath. He talks about the work of faith. The NIV translates that as work produced by or work that comes out of our faith. Well, that's exactly what James would say. So, Here's another way of maybe thinking about the two different writers who talk, again, in similar language, but addressing quite different situations. James, in his specific historical context, stresses the necessity of post-conversion works, right? So these are works, these are actions, these are deeds of love for one neighbor, namely caring for those in need, not showing favoritism, and all of this is done as a natural response to God's gift of grace and righteousness. Paul, in his specific historical context, quite different from that of James, he strongly denies, not works, but more accurately, pre-conversion works. Works of the law, such as circumcision, following Jewish food laws, following the Jewish religious calendar, all these things done somehow to get or obtain or secure God's righteousness. So I think this is a helpful distinction when you think about works and James and Paul. Think James is talking about post-conversion works, works that occur after one is already a believer, whereas Paul, sometimes, when he's talking negatively about works, is talking about pre-conversion works, works done in order to become a believer or a Christian, supposedly. Or if you don't like that distinction, here, I think, is a kind of a clever medical metaphor that Francis Gensch has given. It goes like this. Paul is dealing with obstetrics, namely with how life begins. James, however, is dealing with pediatrics and geriatrics, with how a Christian life grows and matures and ages. It's kind of ironic that when we turn to Luther's commentary on Romans, that Luther says something about faith that sounds awfully like James. Luther, who didn't like James, who didn't think it belonged in the canon, he speaks awfully James-like in the preface to his commentary on Romans about faith. Notice what he says. Oh, it is a living, busy, active thing, this faith. It is impossible for it not to be doing good things incessantly. It, that is faith, does not ask whether good works are to be done, but before the question is asked, it has already done this and is constantly doing them. Whoever does not do such works, however, is an unbeliever. He gropes and looks around for faith in good works, but knows neither what faith is nor what good works are. Yet he talks and talks with many words about the faith and good works. Well, We've reached the end of our detailed and lengthy exegesis, our interpretation of this strategic passage, James 2, 14 to 26. And again, I hope and I'm optimistic you've learned a lot of important things about what God is saying in this passage on this particular subject. But I also hope that you see again the greater purpose that this discussion has had, namely that we now have yet another illustration, another example of how to properly read the Bible for all it's worth, that we approach the text from a grammatical, a literary, historical, and theological perspective. And if we do so, we can be confident that we accurately hear not only what God was saying to the people then and there, but also, therefore, we have confidence about what God is saying to his people here and now. Thank you for your time and attention.